to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Marie Sini. She is Provost Emeritus, University of Maryland, University College, and currently the Higher Education Lead for Service Makers Opportunity Colleges. Um, she has been five years as Provost at UMUC, uh, and she moved to a Senior Innovation Fellow on July 1st of 2017 to impact higher education as a thought leader. During her tenure at UMUC, she led the development of an outcomes-based curriculum focused on public <laughs> In undergraduate school, created the Center for Innovation and Learning and Student Success, and led both the undergraduate and graduate schools to completely replace publisher textbooks with open educational resources. Quite a challenge. Dr. Cini? with me. I was stuck in Atlanta most of the day, um, as most of us are when we have to fly through Atlanta. Um, and then, of course, it was storming here, so when our little plane came down, uh, it was one of it. This woman was sitting across the aisle from me, and I think she was really terrified. She was out in the chair, she was literally yelling, like, Ooh! just been my, it's my pleasure to be here and tell you about it. You'll see that the uh, dates on the PowerPoint are a little bit out of date, because this is what I was going to tell you about after we came here. So the first thing I'd like to know is, I've seen a list of everybody who's here and kind of what schools you're, you're uh, from. What? Let me see it. Let me see how I can ask this so it's not confusing. How many of you are actively working with OER someplace in your institution? Okay, so, so there's actually maybe half. And how many of you are here to kind of understand more about them and maybe start doing things at your institution? Okay. How many of you are here to heckle us and tell us that we are the worst possible people in the world taking away your academic freedom? <laughs> That good, but it's a friendly audience. Uh, I've had a few of those folks over the past few years. So, what I want to talk to you about today is um, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story, and the story is pretty simple. It's about serving the needs of students. So, I need to tell you that at UMUC, we focus 100% uh, on students because our our roots are with serving military students. So in 1947, some faculty who were kind of renegades from University of Maryland College Park decided that they wanted to start teaching veterans coming back from World War II in the evening. And the College Park faculty did not want to get into that. That was below them. You know, they would teach during the day. They didn't want this night school kind of thing. And so these renegade faculty sort of started a continuing ed unit and started offering classes at night. And two years later, the Department of Defense asked UMUC, or actually at the time it was still College Park, asked them if they would go over to post World War II Europe, because there's so many bases, so many folks were still over there in the services, and teach on the ground. And of course, these renegade faculty were like, yeah, that's cool. So they went over, and to this day, in UMUC, about half of their 85,000 students are military, active duty, veteran, families, contractors, etc. And of course, has now become an online powerhouse um, because we always sort of went to the student or provided services to the student in ways that were accessible for them. And then adult students just started signing up online in droves. So on these I'm not saying that at most schools, the schools are not uh, focused on their students. But in some ways, um, you know, we don't even have like a traditional campus. So everything we do, we don't have research faculty, et cetera, our faculty are teaching and um, they design curricula, et cetera. 
So when we make a change, we usually go big. And this is kind of a story of the big change that we made. So as you know, and I'm sorry if you've probably seen these uh, slides before. If you have, sorry if you haven't. Yay, I'm teaching you something new. The um, increases in new college textbook prices 5%, which, you know, just over the past 10 years, like, it's outstripping everything else. It's just enormous. And um, so you can look at these kind of charts, but the, the key thing is when you start talking to individual students, and I'm going to tell you a story about that because that's what really started to get me thinking about this. You know, the textbooks are a big business. I'm not anti-textbook publishers. I get that a lot, too. Textbook publishers actually did us a service in the 1940s and 50s with the large land grant institutions that, yes, we need veterans coming back and going to school. You know, we have large, large lecture hall courses, and, and just more students there. Or faculty were having to teach larger groups of students. So to think about it, um, having textbooks that publishers produced, especially with all the great extra material, right, the PowerPoints and the test bank and all of that, it really kind of made life easier. But um, you know, look, I've been a faculty member, so I know. It also made us, I think, a little bit lazy uh, because then courses started becoming, well, on night one, we'll cover chapter one, and on night two, we'll cover chapter two, right? None of you ever do that, right? You just design your own course, right? And never just rely on the textbook to, like, lay out the weeks. Of course, that's what we did. That's what I always did. 15 chapters in a psychology textbook, 15 weeks. Isn't that interesting how that works? <laughs> so it worked really well for a long time. But um, you know, we're just at a point that it's, that model is not working anymore. And the textbook publishers know this. And there are obviously different models here representing new ways of thinking about that. So it's also important to understand University of Maryland University College. And um, it, they are, I'm actually not technically affiliated anymore with Provost Emeritus, but I've taken on a whole new challenge that I'll tell you a little bit about. I like to do big things, right? I get bored if it's maintenance status quo, but our population is, it pretty much is kind of like the new majority student out there. Um, so 57% female, most are parents, these are predominantly adult students. Uh, they're often first generation in college, uh, and with new waves of, of immigrant populations, that just keeps continuing. Um, they, off, they are either paying out of pocket or through a program and or loans. And of course, if they're in the military, they have tuition assistance. If they're veterans, they have you know veteran the post eleven GI bill. But these folks don't have mom and dad writing their check. And I'm sure many of your students are in the same boat. Um, community colleges, if you look at our students in community college students, very, very similar um, in many ways. So, as I told you, many are military students and their families. And um, so I want to tell you now another story, and that's the story of the diner and a meeting in Las Vegas or what I like to call sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I think you're going to get a little bit of each, really. I'm going to make, going to spice this up. Uh, so... The story of the diner, and we'll, we'll then go to the boring stuff, but the story of the diner is I was having dinner or breakfast with my partner at a diner that's close to where our university is on a Saturday morning. And this young woman was waiting on us, and she uh, was talking to the people in the, at the table next to us, and they, were, they clearly knew her and probably came in every Saturday, and so we overheard this. And, they were asking her about her classes, her textbooks, her kids, and she started to talk about her schedule. So she works four days, four 12-hour days. Her like mom takes care of the kids. She's a single parent. And then for three days, she just does all of her coursework. And she has, she has this complex calculus of how she writes textbooks. So in some cases, um, she would split one with a friend, and in some cases, she would get an old copy. And in some cases, I heard her say, well, if it's like a, you know, a general education course or gen ed, I, you know, I try to just fake it through, like a C is okay, and a lot of times you can do that. And I was just sitting there like, oh my God, this is terrible, this poor woman. And then it hit me, it's like, oh no, don't let her be one of our students. 
please don't let her be one of our students. Because um, we have a lot of a lot of you know schools in the area. It could have been a number of other places. So when she came back over, I asked her of course she was one of our students. And I took her card and uh, made sure we got her a scholarship for those textbooks. But it really hit me in ways that those charts didn't, right? When you have like the individual person and you just you know, nobody was telling her what to say. I overheard this. Uh, so that was sort of one piece. Of it. And I had been following the OER kind of movement. It was like 2010, 2011. I had been following it, and I knew there would come that tipping point when there were enough resources out there that we might be able to do something in a big way instead of just a drip, a drab, a little bit here, a little bit there. But I didn't know if we were ready yet. But then uh, we had a it was a CCM meeting, that big military meeting every year out in Las Vegas. And um, again, we still have these contracts with the Department of Defense to offer programs, face-to-face -face classes overseas in Europe and also in Asia. And so when we go to these meetings, we often have our own little summit and talk about if a contract is coming up again, what are we going to put in the contract? Because the government often wants to see you know, what's new, what's going on that you can really help the service members. And here's a lesson for you. Never have like a generative idea in front of your president because <laughs> presidents love like the big shiny cool idea, right? And so I said, you know, maybe one of the things we could tell them is that we're gonna move to all open education resources and that's what the service members don't have to pay for textbooks. And he looked at me and said, do you think we can do that? And I said, yeah, I, I, I think so. I'm pretty sure. I'll check into it. And didn't really take it as seriously as I, well, they put in the contract and we got the contract again. We always get the contract because not that it's a fix or something, but we've had it for so long, it's just really hard to compete on those things. And so we said we were going to put OERs in, but for a very good reason. Well, one is just the cost. If you're in the service, you don't make a whole lot of money. You don't. People think, oh, well, we're getting all this free money and we give them a barracks and everything, but it's very hard, especially if you have a family. So they don't have excess money. They might have tuition assistance, but they don't have out-of-pocket money for their textbooks. And so we were, we were actually providing a lot of scholarships for service members, et cetera. But still, we had data. We were following our students. We knew that large our numbers were not getting the textbooks at all. There was a significant chunk that would tell us, well, I figure out which courses I don't need the textbook, and then I just don't buy them. Now, there's something wrong with that. When, when things are so expensive, and if we really believe and think that these textbooks are something that they should be learning from, but they're not getting them, it's degrading their education. Now it's, it's not just access, it's also quality and learning outcomes, etc. I did. It was the right thing to do to not just do this for military students, but to do it for all students. And that's how this big project was birthed. And I had no idea what I was getting into. So, um, you are probably already an expert on OER today. You've heard from some of the best already. Uh, but, you know, these are. And one of the things that I see happening all the time is that people who have never delved into the OER world think it's, I don't know, maybe um, just some, you know, video, like some, not even videotapes, but just lecture notes or somebody puts an exercise together. They don't understand the rich assortment of OERs that are out there in all kinds of media. And um, so it was important to know that these are community of free people, courses, course materials, models, text, streaming videos, test software, lots of things are part of this whole set of OER materials. And the key there is then you can adapt it for your own use. So in fact, what I often tell faculty is it's a way to sort of take back the curriculum. 
Like we've given the curriculum away in many ways. We've given it over to textbook publishers. I don't blame them. I mean, they, we gave it to them, right? They took it. So now it's time to sort of think about how we take that back and actually be in charge of our curriculum through knowing about these resources and using them. Uh, so I wanted to do play you a little video that I found just really kind of cute and interesting. And where's our wonderful sound person? Um, here, we'll just go like this. See if that works. For the longest time, the society's involved very I'm trying to get rid of the little box. Sorry. We'll let the expert do it. Let's see. Is this the video? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is. But it's blocking it by. Sorry, technical difficulty. It's a really good little video, so I'd really like you to see it. So, oh, you know, all eyes are on my head. Don't you love trying to fix this under pressure? He's, a, he's an expert. Um, I will tell you while we're trying to get it to play, part of why I like this is that it is so hard sometimes for faculty and administrators to understand what we're talking about. And this really sums it up. I haven't seen it. I really would like to show it to you. If not, it's, it's in the files. Yeah, I don't know why that's blocking it, but um, there you go. Is this going to GM? No, it's actually been. So, yeah. It's good. Sounds kind of weird, right? And that's 
you know, freely, you can all use this. It's a CC bar license. So, I don't know, the sound might have been a little bit off. Does the sound off? Or is it okay? It, it actually shouldn't play normally, but I don't know why I decided not to today. Maybe it's been sitting there as a little file for too long. Um, let's see. i got to get the slides back. Sorry. Gotcha. I tell him you toured with Ozzy Osbourne. I didn't. See, he's an expert. Did he tell you that? He toured with Ozzy Osbourne, so he's an expert. Okay, so um, another really important thing that, uh, again, many of our faculty anyway didn't understand, and I was remiss, <laughs> seriously. I thought that everybody was reading about OERs, kind of like I did, right? I was following it, reading it, and I was like deeply into it. Our faculty really hadn't been, and so we had to do quite a bit of education with them to bring them along. And the five R's is so important because it's not just finding these materials, it's actually then thinking about how to repurpose them and use them. So, Yes, you can make a moment copy. Uh, you can reuse them in some new ways, but you can also revise them as long as you know that, which I think is something that we don't do enough of, or we don't think about doing enough of that. You don't have to use it as is. That's the whole point. Like, make it useful for your class and your school and the point you want to make. Uh, you can combine them. Like, you know, mix it up, if that makes sense. Uh, and you can share them. In fact, this is so important. You can share them with others. And this was something that um, at UMBC anyway, we, we had we, we kind of got okay with using them. But then when we would say, well, and the materials we have developed, we should make really shareable with the people. Like, wait a minute, we're going to give away the secret sauce. And so there is no secret sauce. Content is not the secret sauce anymore, right? So we need to be part of this. There's, any, there's another message I would take back is, I mean, your faculty who develop their own OERs, really encourage them to share them. And I, I think now, you know, I'll tell you what's happening, you know, and that all is going to be happening. There'll be a lot of sharing going on. Um, it is not just Wikipedia. One of the things that I was, um, uh, shall I say, accused of when we started this, even though I had communication plans and I talked to folks about what it was, but I had faculty in your near DC. Everybody writes to the governor. It's all very political. They write, they write to the Baltimore Sun. They write to the chancellor's office. These people are actively engaged in politics. And so when they're upset, that's what they'll do. So there were letters that I was just changing all of the material. Instead of textbooks, we were just going to send students to links on Wikipedia. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, that shows more about what, you know, they didn't understand what they were afraid of. I understood that. So we did lots of work trying to help them understand that it wasn't just a link to Wikipedia. Not Wikipedia. I mean, where's the first place you all go when you want to learn something in general? You go to Wikipedia. It might not be the final thing you use, but come on, we all use it. So I think it's also important to... Um, you know, help people understand that it is not just a link to Wikipedia. And there is a nice little video here that I'm wishing would play easily. New. No. Let's go back. He's going to hate me. Was Ozzy this hard? <laughs> Harder than Ozzy. There's going to be a link there somewhere. Okay. You have the magic touch. We just need sound. So. Thanks.
Okay, I promised you sex. Got it. <laughs> we got some rock and roll. And I'm so, um, anyway, I wanted to show you that because it's so beautiful. I feel my blood pressure going down. It's hard to look at that and say, gee, OERs are just somebody's notes that they copied and then put on some sort of a, you know, in Merlot. They, they, they never, and the people who criticize it don't know that these are all curated materials, Jerry. I mean, I've been a reviewer, right? But the level of what people think OERs, it's, it's just we've got to help educate people what's going on with OERs. So people often ask us, how did we do this? Because when you're trying to do it, remember, we have 85,000 students. Um, we, we run literally, you know, hundreds of sections every eight weeks. So anything that we do really becomes a major production, production kind of unit, like literally like a, fac like a factory. We didn't know how to do this, but we sort of stumbled into a model, and, and people do still call me and other people at UMUC and ask how to do it. So what we discovered is that if you can, it's nice to have a system like this, rather than having people do it in sort of different ways, each faculty member finding their own materials, um, faculty struggling with how to put those materials in the part of the course. Faculty are, I'm not bad-mouthing faculty at all, faculty are wonderful. They, they know their content. They often don't know where to go to look for OERs. They don't know how to best design the course in a way that they can use OERs appropriately. So we need to get them help. It's just like having an online unit or virtual, um, that, or, or an organization that helps you understand how to do distance learning. And so what we put together was um, we have instructional designers and we have a wonderful library staff. So it was great to see uh, the voice of the librarians up here when I walked in because this is, I think, a whole new world where the, li the, li the folks in the library who get bashed all the time, why don't we just go online, why do we need human beings in a building, and you know, it, it's, it's hard times being uh, something at a university that is a wonderful service, but you have to sort of make sure that you can tell people what you're doing. Who better to help us find resources and curate them than our librarians? Now, I'll tell you, it wasn't, um, it wasn't an easy sell because even our library staff didn't quite understand what it was. And they were used to searches behind that firewall of you know, peer-reviewed peer scholarship. And so we really had to help them understand how powerful this could be if they would become the experts on this. And I have to say our library staff at UMUC now really does know a whole lot more about this. And they built a website along with the instructional designers Every time we would find a new repository or a new source of OER, we would add it. Um, because if, if you're a typical faculty member teaching psychology, I'll use an example, you're not sitting around looking for OERs, right? So we needed to help them and say, here's where you should go to look for this. And there really are great places to go. Um, so you, you have to have somebody searching who knows how to search hence library staff, and they taught some of our instructional designers. So we have some instructional designers that were uh, sort of dedicated to this project, and they learned how to do this as well. Once you have the materials, let's say it's for Site 101, Introductory to Psychology, pulling those resources is then what you want to do is hand them over to the faculty and get a team of faculty if you can, um, and have them curate them. This is still all about faculty driving the curriculum, but you have to help them see the resources. So being able to do something like that is very powerful. We've aligned all of our programs. We've got learning outcomes, et cetera, and so it was really about matching to the right learning outcome. And then our instructional designers, because we're sort of this big online institution for the most part. We have some face-to-face -face classes, but mostly online. Then, then the instructional designers go back to in the, in the courses in a way that, you know, 
announced hundreds of sections. So once we sort of developed this process, it became like a flywheel. Just kept going. And people understood their roles and they understood what they were doing, and it was a lot of work, but it was doable. And we did this over three years. So uh, from late 2013 to the fall of 2016, we did this for over a thousand different courses. Separate courses, not sections of some courses, but every course in our catalog. Yeah, somebody says, wow, yeah, believe me. Um, and in the undergraduate school, we started with the undergraduate school because that was where the biggest need was. That's where the students were just really having a hard time um, paying for their tickets. And we have 67,000 students, give or take. Uh, undergraduate students, and so we did them first in about two years. And we figured we, um, the graduate school wasn't as pressing a need, and uh, we could teach the undergraduate school could teach them a lot, and the graduate school smaller, and sort of could help them move through that. Uh, then and that's what happens. The graduate school has about eighteen thousand students, and that was finished up in three years. And um, we know today, this is probably out of date now, but probably now we've saved students. And here's the assumption. If every student buys a new textbook, this is what they would have saved out of pocket since we put the OERs in place. Now, we know that not every student bought a textbook, so maybe it's a little inflated, but it's a good way to sort of measure the impact of this. So it's $19 million. It's probably up to $21 million now. This is huge. I mean, it really is huge. When you think about how much you're saving the students without sacrificing quality. And What's the annual number? What's the annual savings number? The annual is probably three to four million, something in that vicinity. And your scale the numbers go up very quickly. Um, and we won an award. We didn't even know we were up for an award. But they contacted us, the Open Education Consortium, and they were like, hey, Project. So we wanted to give you the special president's award, and we were so excited. And I got to tell you that the external validation helped us so much internally because because then any of our critics were like, oh, so outside people think this is cool. They think this is a good thing to do. Yeah, a lot of people are actually looking at this and don't know how to do it yet. But uh, you know, so all of these badges were signatures. So now you can ask, well, who else is using OERs? Well, very few places are thinking about it at scale like this, but almost every institution that you can think of is doing something with OERs. I just put some up there that I found, right? Some big names that people might not think about. You know, certain community colleges. Um, I know at least one person's here from Virginia, from Tidewater Community College. Okay. And uh, Harvard's doing it. And not just UMUC anymore in the Maryland system, but more and more of the system. So one day, uh, when our project was sort of announced, the front page of the student newspaper over in College Park, right, that's the big traditional flagship institution, R1, the, the headline on the front page was, you know, like, UMCP faculty, why aren't you giving us free textbooks? They had caught wind of what we were doing, and it was the students that were driving it. And I saw that and thought, oh, no. I mean, you just really don't want to get into competition with other institutions, right, in your system. So um, we, we have had so many student groups come to us, and I always have to say to them, please do not pit us against your president and your provost and your faculty. That is not a good strategy. Um, they, they are upset they are because your kids you know, are also trying to um, pay for college. So, um, uh, oh, well, we talked about the, li the library staff. It's a new role for libraries. And if you go to a lot of institutions, probably some of your own institutions, librarians are very smart. They're putting up pages of resources for faculty. And if they're not, it's a nice way to legitimize it. So ask your folks if they would do that. Because I still, you know, faculty have a lot of respect for library staff and library professionals, and I think it's a nice partnership. 
So I know some private schools in the New York system that are uh, really concerned about, not in the system, rather, they're private institutions in New York, and they're worried about that new Excelsior grant where you can, the students can get free tuition if they live on campus and then stay in New York after they graduate. And so uh, it's the library folks who are starting to sort of push the initiative at this school because the provost can't push it, the deans can't push it. They think that a play could be that the, the library folks who know a lot about this would hey, faculty, look at this cool stuff, and then your students don't have to pay a lot for materials and course. So, you know, of course, one question you might have, lots of people have asked us, are students still learning? Or is this really a decrement? Like, is it like quality is going down? So, um, what was really interesting is now there's more research happening out there. And, you know, David Waterley and colleagues have been doing a lot of this uh, research. And here's, a, here's one from 2015. And what they found was relative to courses with published textbooks, students using OER text, text performed as well or better on course completion final grade of C minus or higher than their final course grade. So they actually found positive outcomes in terms of grades and course completions. And you can speculate why the materials are there from day one. Nobody has to actually go out and buy them. You know, we have a lot of military students. Even if our military students ordered a book, it takes sometimes three weeks to get to them in Okinawa. By then, in an eight-week course, that has a lot of course on how it looks. They also perform better on enrollment and testing, that they then took more credits in subsequent semesters. Um, maybe we should test this. Maybe because they didn't have to spend it on the textbooks. So they can go, hey, I can take another course and see my enrollment. And well, they took more than that semester and then also the following semester. So some positive things are coming out. At UNBC, we looked at it, and um, what we know is that relative to all the same courses when we had publishers' textbooks versus the same courses a year later with OERs, it was the same, you used grades as a proxy, it was the same spread. So there was no decrease no in learning by grades. Um, but students were saving a lot of money. Now, I know they're going on to do more studies. We think that once students get used to it, that we would see an increase in learning outcomes. I have to say, I taught using the OER model because I wanted to know what it was going to be like. And it was hard to keep reminding students all the materials are in your course. Um, they either, I think, thought, well, there's no technical work. And I'd have to know, go back and put that link, and that's the material, and that's what you need to use. And you're, there's, there's almost something almost in, you know, invisible about it. So the design of your courses really need to link to what they're doing to remind them. And I think the more we actually integrate, you're going to see an increase in learning outcomes. Um, so back in Maryland, right? And I told you the front page uh, of the traditional students. So they put pressure on the system and said, we want you to start doing this with courses. And so what came about in the rest of the system, there's 11 other schools in the Maryland system, is something called the Boston Initiative. Um, they replaced the textbooks, the bars, and uh, in 60 courses at 14, oh, it used to be 14, I don't know. There's a couple of institutes. So 14 other institutions in the system. And um, nothing bad happened, the students learned. So they're spreading that initiative, and it's, there's more of this going on across the system. And then, um, so we have this wonderful state senator in Maryland named Jim Rosenkamp. And he, he's really good to his constituents, but he's always cooking up something. So when I was at UMUC, he had me on his cell phone and he'd call me all the time. He would find out who, who had some interesting ideas, right? Because he's always looking for something to put in a bill. And he was always looking for re-election, right? So he loved this OER thing. And he actually got $100,000 put into an estate, a state appropriation to start a Maryland, state of Maryland, all state 
schools and the community colleges an overall repository for OER so that all the schools could share in them and also contribute to them. And that has already taken off. In fact, just a few weeks ago, there was a big summit uh, that the system sponsored, and I think they had like 500 people attend. I mean, it was a really big thing. And I'm, you know, I just feel so good about that because now it's not just UMUC, it's spreading to all the whole system. Um, and it's going to take off. So there's a number of resources. I mean, you've got some resources listed there. I, I put some resources up here that we have relied quite a bit on. And, you know, they're adding all kinds of things. Sailor Academy is doing some interesting things, uh, free courses. There's a lot of free course, courses out there that you can use. And so that's my story of taking care of students. And yeah, I had a major point for you to take away is that it's not just about access, it's also about quality and it's about retention. And I think we're starting to see that data. Your students are going to stay, they're going to take more credits, they're going to get closer to graduation. So it's been my pleasure, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them before a break. I know, I'm right between you and probably a glass of wine. <laughs> Here's a question. Yeah, this is really, I have to say it's disarming. Every time I look over my shoulder, I feel like there's this woman behind me. so much. He's, he's really good, but you know, he just didn't buy into this at first. He would have said, there's nothing out there. And we would have said, did you look? Oh, okay, well, it's not out there. So he found it in there. Now, what's wonderful is he and his assistant director, they are like born again OER. And they're like, we've taken the curriculum back, and now we're teaching that the way it should be taught, but not the way these publishers have decided like whatever, but they embraced it, right? So you're going to find, and I don't know that there was a pattern, like our biology folks grabbed it right away. Um, they really liked it. Um, I think business was mixed. We had an accounting. Accountants are going to have some, some nervousness about it because of the um, accounting exam that, you know, the board that, the, that their graduates have to take to become a CPA or whatever. And I had one county professor like, well, when I was in college, we used this book. It was the Bible. And if you don't have this book on your shelf, people are going to think you didn't really learn cost accounting. I was like, how often do people actually look on your bookshelf and, you know, judge you based on the textbook you had 20 years ago? Um, so we got them past that. And in fact, the rates of our students passing the CPA exam are very high. They're the highest in the states. We had to get over the, or in the in Maryland, we had to get over the whole online thing. There was a time when, what, you're an accountant that you learned it, you learned it over online? So we got past that, and now this was a whole new thing. We did have to spend some time on various accreditors, program accreditation, really. Um, but uh, no, but I think, you know, you find individual faculty who are, who are the, sort of the early champions. And what we tried to do was take those early champions 
time, you know, the theory of innovation. Um, then the big middle comes along, and look, there are still people who I'm sure are writing letters to the governor, even though I'm not there anymore. Um, and so, but we actually had some faculty who were really upset about it. We didn't like the resources that were in the course, and we said, okay, let's take a look at it. Pulled them in, looked at it again, changed it, and now they're happy. Um, I think you have to sort of find out to start talking to people. Have a wonderful speaker like Cable Green come in. That was one of our secret tactics, right? Because he's a very good speaker, as you know. And so we had him come in and sort of talk to everybody, and that really helped convert a lot of people because they saw it as a really, this is a real thing, you know, this crazy idea that the provost put up. Yeah, I would really downplay. That was another mistake. Don't, don't. This should not be a provost or president or dean idea. This should be the faculty all embracing it. Uh, I was a little too excited. I thought everybody would be excited. Murray, yes. uh, under our program for virtual campus, I'm hosting a very safe program for our program. First, I just want to thank you for arriving here safely. Oh. Uh, most important, I really enjoyed the presentation. I'd like to talk a little bit about the student experience side of I've dealt with a lot of past with students. There are little learners currently in the military, uh, specifically APO overseas. And some of the issues that I run into in the past is where we uh, don't fully disclose uh, in depth to students the software that they can run into at the time of the course registrations, and they become very discouraged once they actually get into that course. Or if it serves numbers, if they're using a government computer, some software they won't even be able to access. A lot of resources they won't even be able to use. Uh, simple things as PDFs, Wikipedia pages, and so forth. So my question is, I'm wondering, is there any sort of communication that you give to students at the time of registration of courses, specifically details, what software will be involved, uh, and any restrictions or obstacles that they may run into? So uh, I have about three different answers to that. So one of the things we've made very very careful to separate out OERs from software packages. Um, and in general, because of our student population, <coughs> we have to go towards a more vanilla version of almost anything we do. So if there's a um, you know if there's a software package for a particular discipline, if it's going to be difficult for somebody behind the military firewall, you really have to find another solution or not use it. Too many where students can be in there. So that's already been kind of a policy for us. Like we really have to think about our students and not, you know, scare them because it's really frustrating when you can't get what you need to do to pass your course. Um, but also, there are some software packages um, in our IT area. There's, you know, IT virtual labs, etc., that you can buy, and you, there's just not a good OER solution to that yet. There, there, Certain areas that people are focusing on and working on. We need to have many more of these resources. If it's something that was so important as a software package that like that's really the only way they can learn this online, that we didn't consider that a textbook. We, this was really about the publisher kind of textbook. However, there are other things that students were concerned about. Some students still really wanted to have a hard copy of something, right? They still had to look to this whole, like, I can have all my articles on my iPad. Isn't that cool? Yay. Um, and so they would say, you know, I print out a lot of stuff kind of thing. And we tried to make it as easy for them to access it in the course as possible. So we had it. We make sure these are all loaded into a content management system that then points to the course so they're not in the actual course. And to them, it's seamless. They do not think that they're going out anywhere to get it, right? And if it's not there readily available, you wouldn't keep it in the course. Um, the other piece, and so usability is also very important because you know, there's different abilities. And so we actually screen for that as well. So we don't use an OER if like, it's hard for somebody who has a screen reader. If they can't use it, then we might not use it, or at least we give them an alternate to how they can get that information. This gets very complex. But it's still solvable. You just create a system. Um, and I think the thing that we have learned to do, and we're doing more of it, there UMUC is now. After ten years, it's hard not to say we. It's still very much a part of my identity. 
But we are, uh, keep saying, doing more with wraparound materials. All right, so one of the good things the textbooks do is they sort of give you an integrated overall view of the, of the curriculum, or the discipline, you know, usually. Um, and that's sometimes missing with OER, so you have to have that kind of wraparound, and so our instructional designers and the faculty are working on that in certain places. But yeah, it's really important to listen to the students. You can't put these in your course and then try to go home, right? It's constant that you have to keep changing these things, so there is, you know, there's an internal cost to this, right? But you're still saving the students. So we chose not to pass any of that cost on to our students. I'm not suggesting that that's what you do. There's different business models here. You can charge for the services, for curating them, etc. It's always going to be a lot cheaper than having them go by textbook. But we just decided not to give them our student Any other questions? Yes. Maria touched uh, briefly on the <laughs> You touched briefly about putting out materials and students wanting hard copy. That's one of the things I keep hearing from my faculty well, the students are just going to put it out anyway, so how are you safe? Has anybody just that? Apple, what's your point of time? Uh, we're going to have the other with all of our science courses from last year, and um, some of the faculty actually bundled the cost of printing the chapters that they would be covering, say, in our intro biology course. He to a lab fee, I think they increased the lab fee by five dollars, and they worked out a deal to print these in bulk so the students get a full punch pile of papers the first day of class. Um, for some of our grandchildren, we did actually have to stop them from printing the entire 300 page course book out. Um, that was the thing that happened. Oh, yes, we didn't think it was going to happen. We have three hundred on that campus for a few reasons, and suddenly all of our country people was gone, and the world was heading. Um, so that was the thing. We were trying to kind of say, hey, you can, we're going to open staff to run open staff further. So we do encourage them to use the open staff to put a, a print copy on reserve at every campus so they can actually check out the print. You know, I also think some of this is a design issue. Um, that you have to design the course a certain way and link them to the material. You have to help them understand what they should be doing with the material. I think what we're seeing there is this whole like, I'm going to lecture at you and we're going to have a test, so you better like memorize or at least look at every page. And, and so I think, you know. Whole literacy here that faculty have to get into and the students have to learn. That's just that's just probably the way they did it before. And we're all gonna have to do work on that. So I work for Open Stacks and Nicole, and uh, we have hard cover, full color versions of the textbooks that we sell on Amazon, but more importantly through your college bookstore. Um, and I say that's important for employers. It's number one, the hard cover, full color copies because we're printing so many of them, we can put them on each stream with the cost. So the thin ones go for 29, the super thick Astronomy book, which I want you to carry around, is fine. It's ridiculous. Uh, but having them in your college bookstore allows the students to use their financial aid or other resources to get those print copies. Um, it also helps us get to make a couple dollars on all of those, which helps with our sustainability and funds the revisions of our books, um, which we just come out with new editions of some of the books. So it's fun with that. Um, and the other thing is, is that like, it, it really is a better deal for your students because if the students, and they call us, and it's awful because they call and say, I took the sociology book to Kinko's and I haven't printed it out. It was 100 Again, 
probably no one is telling the students how to study, that they don't actually need the whole book, how to, how to access the material online, or that there's a 29. There's this huge gap in universities between the faculty and the students. Students, and they don't know what the students don't know, and you know, I think there has to be. In Maryland, they passed a law that we had to have far more transparency about all kinds of information and comparison of courses and, and textbook prices, and I think that's good. I think the more students actually take the power and ask these hard questions, the better. 